I'm a professor of medicine and of epidemiology and population health uh, at Stanford University. I'm uh, one of the two uh, directors, co-directors of the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford, or METRICS. So I chose for today Dr. John Ioannidis from Stanford University, and um, I am going to tell you all about him because I think it's really important to set the stage for how qualified this guy really is to make the comments that he's making. He is the CF Renborg Chair in Disease Prevention, Professor of Medicine of Health Research and Policy, of Biomedical Data Science and of Statistics, and Co-Director of Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford University. He was the valedictorian at Athens College, won the National Award of the Greek Mathematical Society in 1984. He graduated at the top of his medical school class from the National University of Athens, received his degree in biopathology from the same institution, trained at Harvard and Tufts in internal medicine and infectious disease, held positions at the National Institutes of Health Johns Hopkins and Tufts, chaired the Department of Hygiene and Epidemiology, University of Ioannina Medical School, in 1999 to 2010, while also holding adjunct professor positions at Harvard, Tufts, and Imperial College. He was the senior advisor on knowledge integration at the National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Health, served as president for the Society of Research Synthesis Methodology. Believe it or not, I'm not finished. More credentials to come. He's on the editorial board of many leading journals, including PLOS Medicine, Lancet, Annals of Internal Medicine, and JNCI, Journal of the National Cancer Institute, among others. Editor-in-chief of the European Journal of Clinical Investigation from 2010 to 2019, delivered around 600 lectures. Recipient of many awards, too many to list or this would just take up way too much time. The PLLS Medicine paper on why most published research findings are false has been the most accessed article in the history of the Public Library of Science, over 3 million hits. Ioannidis is the author of seven literary books in Greek, three of which were shortlisted for Best Book of the Year, Brave Thinker Scientist for 2010, and according to The Atlantic, may be one of the most influential scientists ever. Highly cited research, researcher, his current citation rate is over 4,000 per month. So I wanted to go through all that because I want to put aside the issue of um, credentials. All right, so Anybody who wants to argue with this guy's credentials, feel free. I don't think you'll get very far. My research is interested in appraising evidence, in trying to understand uh, data, strengths of data, and weaknesses of data, and trying to make sure that we have the most useful information to make decisions that matter. Unfortunately, much of the information that we have collected so far, and this is not to blame anyone, it's uh, just uh, something that has arisen very fast and uh, has uh, caught us off guard in a way. It's a new pandemic. Most of that information is not reliable. We, we have increasing evidence that many of the key features that uh, pertain to what this pandemic is about, uh, uh, how uh, lethal is that virus, how many people it has infected or, or will infect, what is likely to be the eventual impact, and how effective are the different measures that we're applying. We have major gaps in practically uh, all of those fronts. Uh, the WHO indeed uh, released an estimate of a case fatality rate of 3.4%, uh, which at the time of the release uh, uh, earlier in March, it was based on the number of people who had died as the nominator and the number of people who had documented infections as the denominator. And information from settings where we have more complete information about that denominator suggests that the infection fatality rate is much, much lower. We do have some situations currently where we are approximating that number with some fair accuracy. One situation was actually a very early experience in the course of the pandemic. We have a cruise ship, Diamond Princess, where we had an outbreak of SARS-CoV-2. Many people got infected. This is a situation where you have a closed space. People cannot really go anywhere. They live in very uh, close quarters together for the duration of the cruise. So we had an infection rate of uh, close to 20%. 19% of the passengers and crew got infected. And among those who were infected, as of now, 1% has died. 1% is a figure that... Uh, pertains to a population of mostly elderly people. The, the mean age of the passengers and crew was 58 years old, and the median, I believe, was close to 65. 
And we know now that uh, there's a very strong age gradient. Uh, people who are older have a higher risk. People who are young have a much lower risk. If you try to adjust for the age difference between the passengers and the crew and the general population of a country like the U.S., probably an estimate anywhere between 0.05 up to 1% may be more reasonable to consider as opposed to, let's say, 3.4%. I am collaborating with uh, scientists who are leading the Italian response, and I'm trying to get their insights. And uh, this has been a, a very interesting uh, puzzle uh, that uh, we have been brainstorming on. Uh, there are multiple explanations uh, so far that can be proposed on why uh, Italy uh, really became such a disaster. And these include the following. Uh, first of all, it's uh, demographics. Uh, Italy has the most elderly population in Europe and uh, one of the most uh, elderly populations in the world. The average age of uh, people who die in Italy is 81 years old. And also, most of these people have lots of other underlying diseases. Uh, Italy is a country that has a very strong history of smoking. It has very high rates, therefore, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It has very high rates of uh, coronary heart disease. Uh, and uh, these are very strong risk factors for having a bad outcome in this infection. And uh, it still remains uh, to be decided how many of these infections are deaths with SARS-CoV-2 uh, versus deaths by SARS-CoV-2. There's uh, also other things that probably got wrong in Italy. Uh, Italy has uh, a relatively uh, low number of ICU beds per population. It has about a third of ICU beds per population compared to the U.S. And their system is running at uh, full capacity practically every winter. But you realize that a system that is so close to saturation, to having its maximal capacity, if you add just a little bit more, it can very easily collapse. Italians were the first to be hit in Europe, and that was an exotic pathogen. Everybody thought that uh, they had to do their best. So uh, they said we need to admit these people to the hospital even if they had modest or not so severe symptoms. This resulted in a very bad decision making, and I think that this is something that every other setting that is hit by an epidemic wave needs to avoid. By admitting these mild or moderate cases very quickly, they became saturated, and when they started getting the severe cases, uh, they just had no room for them. So uh, also the hospital became heavily colonized with that new virus. Uh, this is a virus that can stay on surfaces. Uh, many of their medical personnel got infected in that heavily infested environment. So there's, there's a lot of factors that uh, created like the perfect storm. I would be very careful to make inferences based on single case reports and anecdotes. I, I feel that uh, every single patient has the dignity of uh, uh, his life and uh, every single patient is a different story and we have to give great respect uh, to that uh, life and that person. But I'm worried that if we see in the news presentations of single cases as uh, heralded uh, being uh, something that I have never seen before, uh, this is so horrible, uh, that's the worst uh, case of uh, uh, severe uh, respiratory distress syndrome that I have seen, we are uh, falling into a trap of, of sensationalism. I mean, can you imagine what would have happened if uh, 60 million deaths that happen every year in this planet, we had a meter counting them uh, one by one and, and having stories written for each one of them? It, it, it would be horrible. I mean, we have, uh, we have gone into a complete panic state uh, measuring so far uh, a sizable number of deaths, but nothing, nothing close to the total cumulative mortality that we see both in this country and around this world. I, I think that uh, that panic component and that uh, uh, overemphasis of media attention is probably making things worse. We, we do want to sensitize people to follow instructions to try to keep the public health measures to, to shelter in place if they have sheltered in place but we don't want to get them scared. We don't want them to get into panic. This, this doesn't really help. I think that uh, 
uh, there's a very high chance that we are exaggerating. As, as we discussed, many of the features of this pandemic, of course, they're serious, but I think that the estimates are exaggerated. And I think that there's a risk of uh, really making some fundamental decisions about the structure of our civilization, of our society, of our future, that uh, may not be appropriate. Uh, I, th I think that uh, we have no clue how a society would work if you need to uh, build it around uh, a construct where everything is done from a distance. So there are some models that suggest that if you go down that path of uh, basically lockdown, you may need to wait for 18 months. And I'm, I'm extremely worried about that scenario. I'm, I'm not sure that our world, our civilization uh, could survive that. I think that there is not just millions of lives at stake, which is the pessimistic scenarios about uh, SARS-CoV-2. It is billions of lives uh, who might be at stake if we have to protract uh, that for so long. And my plea is to get the best data because we have very serious decisions to make. We should make them as informed as possible. I'm perfectly happy to be in uh, a situation of uh, uh, practically locked down in, in California, more or less, uh, shelter in place. But uh, I think very soon we need to have that information to see what we did with that and where do we go next. We need to learn. I, I think that there is a risk that in this uh, situation there may be other conflicts and other interests that get interspersed and they kind of uh, uh, take over the entire agenda. Uh, that should not become a political debate. That should not become a debate between people who may have different financial conflicts or other conflicts. It should be something that we should all be united about, saving lives, getting the best outcome, and uh, really uh, knowing what are the next steps uh, about uh, what we do with this epidemic and what we do with our world at large.